Which Saturday Night Live breakout starred in an abysmal mafia movie on the moon? What classic board game was adapted into a bizarre alien adventure? These are just a few of the worst sci-fi movies of the 21st century, so far. Nepotism is an unavoidable facet of Hollywood, but that's not entirely a bad thing. Some actors, like Robert Downey Jr. and Laura Dern, have enough genuine talent to let us see past their famous parents when they're in a role. Jaden Smith is not one of these actors. Three years after making a play for movie stardom with the 2010 remake of The Karate Kid, Jaden teamed up with his father Will for M. Night Shyamalan's painfully bland After Earth. In this decaying slice of pulp science fiction, the two Smiths play a father and son duo who feel like they've never met before. The plot is brutally basic, filled to the brim with outdated science fiction tropes and bad character names. Yes, Will's character is named Cypher Rage. Yes, that sounds like it's from a role-playing game. And yes, it's funny every time he says it. General Cypher Rage. This is a message for my wife. M. Night Shyamalan can be accused of many things, but phoning in his work typically isn't one of them. He's dedicated to his premises, and he excels at creating a sense of moody atmosphere. Unfortunately, After Earth is an exception. The director's seat here could have been filled by a body pillow. Check out 1985's Enemy Mine instead. All the same survivalist tropes, but with an actual point to make about cultural empathy. If you know what a JRPG is, you know what Final Fantasy is. In the years since its humble beginnings on the NES in 1990, Final Fantasy has become one of the best-selling role-playing franchises in the world, second only to Pokemon. That's why it wasn't a massive surprise when developer Squaresoft announced that they were branching into the movie world with their debut feature, Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. Unlike earlier video game movies like Super Mario Bros. and Mortal Kombat, Squaresoft decided that their film would be animated entirely in CGI. It was a bold idea, but it meant that every character in the film was stuck deep in the uncanny valley. While the animation style might work for short segments, watching it for an hour and 45 minutes straight is just a chore. Plus, the movie barely has anything to do with the Final Fantasy games anyway. The Spirits Within ended up being a box office bomb, and Square Pictures was quietly absorbed by the VisionWorks cutscene studio soon after its release. There's been a couple more CGI Final Fantasy films released since, but their improved animation and actual connections to the games makes them much more bearable to sit through. In 1986, Hasbro made its first mistake with regard to the Transformers franchise when it slaughtered everyone's favorite robots on the big screen. Gen X kids have a slew of traumatic movie memories to choose from, but watching Optimus Prime slowly fade away is definitely up there. Then, over 30 years later, Michael Bay released Transformers The Last Night proving once again that people refuse to learn from the mistakes of others. By this point, the Transformers franchise was in decline, and the ongoing character assassination of Optimus Prime hurt more than his actual death. A Transformer can be resurrected by clever writing or an all-spark ex machina, but taking away Optimus Prime's unshakable faith was a truly baffling decision. What have I done? The Last Knight certainly doesn't improve matters with its medieval theme. King Arthur's knights are involved, Morgan Le Fay is reimagined as a robot sorceress named Quintessa, and whoever greenlit the Order of Witwickens should probably reconsider their career choices. There was an outbreak of eye-straining blue cinematography going on in the early 2010s, but only Skyline turned it into a plot point. Icy beams are the first sign that something's gone wrong, hypnotizing and abducting Los Angeles residents as dawn breaks. It's up to a group of plucky survivors to… hide out in a condo for 90 minutes. Skyline is an unapologetic retread of zombie outbreak tropes with a science fiction exterior. There's nothing interesting or intelligent about this movie, and none of the characters are actually worth caring about. The indoor environments are samey and stale. It's no surprise that the condo building it takes place in was chosen because one of the directors already lived there. It just doesn't feel like anyone involved in the production was actually trying, making for a rather forgettable experience. It's another blue-tinted science fiction movie, and this time it's based on a classic board game that's been around in one form or another since before World War I. It's 2012's Battleship, and as absurd as its existence might seem, it's a genuine feature film. It's not a very good one, though. First things first, there are aliens in this movie. In case you didn't know, the original game does not have aliens. There's no reason for them to be here, really, other than to give the titular Battleship something to fight. Rihanna is in this movie, which is shameless stunt casting of the highest order. 
Liam Neeson is also in this movie, but he doesn't really get to do much. The movie bridges stupidity and brilliance with how it acknowledges the original game, by using warning buoys to figure out where and how to sink the otherwise untraceable enemy ships. It's interesting, but not nearly interesting enough to warrant the $209 million budget it received. It's not enough to make the movie worth it. If you asked George Lucas about his inspirations for Star Wars, he'd probably mention Valerian and Laureline. The acclaimed comic by Pierre Christine and Jean-Claude Mezier ran from 1967 to 2010 and stars the titular temporal agents as they travel the cosmos in their trusty astroship. Fans of the long-running comic were delighted to learn that Luc Besson would be adapting the story to the silver screen in 2017, but many were singing a different tune once the movie actually released. Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets might look nice. It looks great, actually, but it's like a shiny coat of paint on a spaceship that doesn't fly. The first five minutes are excellent, but things get worse the more people start talking. The biggest issue is the chemistry between Valerian and Laureline, or the lack thereof. Dane DeHaan and Cara Delevingne act like they've only met minutes prior, even though their characters are partners with some major history. Will you marry me? <sighs> Not funny. Without the central dynamic that's present in the comic, the film just doesn't work. It makes about as much sense as taking away Deadpool's mouth. Will Smith has had trouble finding science fiction stories that fit him ever since Men in Black, a point truly hammered home by his double participation in 2019's Gemini Man. This flop isn't Smith's fault, though. The problems lie in the overworked script, a wet noodle of an action screenplay that shares little DNA with its original writer's work. A good story shouldn't be created like a game of telephone, yet that's what happened to the brainchild of writer Darren Lemke. His pitch floated around Hollywood for two decades, attracting big-name stars like Dandruff. All of them shook free over the years, until only Will Smith and Ang Lee remained. You are obviously not the best. There's something touching buried inside Gemini Man. The idea that a clone could change the course of their destiny and become a person in their own right. That's not what's explored, though. Instead, it's an epilogue tag that's cut off before anything meaningful happens. With a new century came a renewed sense of hope, as we all looked for signs as to what our future would hold. In May 2000, we received a clue. If only we had understood the warnings. That's when Battlefield Earth was unleashed, and with it came an omen about how badly this 21st century was going to go. Based on the first half of the novel by Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard, John Travolta's project is centered around a bog-standard chosen one leading a rebellion. It features more Dutch angles than you can shake a copy of Dianetics at, and every single one is pointless. The evil cyclos look misshapen and bizarre. They're brought low by their arrogance, fatally underestimating the walking slice of Wonder Bread known as Johnny Good boy Tyler. That name isn't a crime, but it probably should be. From The Matrix to Cyberpunk 2077, the works on Keanu Reeves' science fiction resume aren't limited to one medium or subgenre. Unfortunately, they're not limited in their quality either, and the worst of the bunch is undoubtedly 2019's replicas. Yes, this snooze fest makes Johnny Mnemonic look good. It starts by touching on the ethical implications of cloning, which is a fine foundation. But unfortunately, the plot itself ends up being Sophie's Choice slapped together with Robocop 2. That might sound like an exaggeration, but it's really not. Keanu's family dies in an accident, and brilliant neuroscientist that Keanu is, he uploads his family's neural maps into cloned bodies. If that wasn't enough, there's also a plot about uploading brains to android super soldier bodies, but they tear themselves apart once they wake up from the procedure. It all somehow leads to a cynically happy finale. Stop the movie after the car accident, we want to get off. Most people don't remember the adventures of Pluto Nash. Eddie Murphy probably wishes he was one of them. Murphy is the centerpiece of an all-star cast, riding high on a career shift that saw him go from Saturday Night Live actor and edgy stand-up comic to the lead in crowd-pleasing family flicks. Director Ron Underwood had previously proven his worth with Tremors and City Slickers, but Pluto Nash was not destined for cult classic status. It's hard to put a finger on where the problem started, but the biggest issue is that the film is about as hilarious as Saving Private Ryan. On paper, the premise is a wacky winner. It has a space mafia and real estate shenanigans on the moon. It has Murphy as a crook who's turning over a new leaf. It has John Cleese, Randy Quaid, and Rosario Dawson. It also has a 4% on Rotten Tomatoes, and frankly, that's too high. The movie has no thematic heart and strands great actors in inexplicable places. The twist, which features a clone of Pluto Nash, is possibly the most nonsensical part of all. Why do so many of these lousy movies involve cloning? 
When Christopher Nolan's Inception came out in 2010, it was a massive deal. Some people got it, a lot of people didn't get it, but said they did, and a whole lot more just didn't get it at all. I didn't get Inception. I didn't get Inception. Oh! Nevertheless, Inception's success proved that mind-bending movies could still be blockbusters, something that Nolan apparently took as a challenge. In 2020, he released his most incomprehensible and inscrutable film yet, the time travel thriller Tenet. In Tenet, John David Washington plays the protagonist. What's his name again? I'm the protagonist. Right. John David Washington plays the protagonist, a man who suddenly finds himself involved in a temporal conspiracy. Washington and his co-star Robert Pattinson both do admirable jobs with what they're given, but this script is just too convoluted for their performances to shine. Plus, half of what they say can barely even be heard. The overblown soundtrack drowns out a good amount of important conversations. With its complex structure and obtuse dialogue, Tenet is definitely an idea that works better on paper than in practice. In 1983, Jaws star Roy Scheider starred in Blue Thunder, a film about a cutting-edge helicopter designed for urban pacification. John Badham's thoughtful thriller set the bar for action-packed stories about political corruption and military overreach. By contrast, in 2005, some generically good-looking people were involved in testing an AI-controlled craft in stealth, and no one learned anything useful. Stealth doesn't have the courage to indict anyone for the failures of an abusive military program. No, this malevolent aircraft goes AWOL after being struck by a bolt of lightning. Not only is that plot device stolen from short circuit, but anyone who's taken high school physics should know that's nowhere close to the way lightning actually works. Regardless, that's the least of this movie's problems. Lousy acting and a love story that feels shoehorned in, among other things, makes this a miserable film experience from beginning to end. There's a reason Blue Thunder pops up on cable, but stealth pops up in Walmart bargain bins. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Slash Film videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.